International News Now. Okay, so President Trump sent two potentially contradictory messages to world leaders during his Asia trip. And so our news today is going to focus on, on that. On the one hand, he called on the world to get behind American efforts to contain the North Korean threat. So that's one of, one of his top agenda items was to try to rally uh, international support around his approach to, uh, the, to North Korea. He received a relatively warm reception to this call for multilateral action to contain North Korea. He reinforced the U.S. commitment to protect its allies, Japan and, North, and South Korea, against any North Korean aggression. He called on China once again, he's been saying this for a while, to use its influence to more forcefully pressure North Korea to start down the road uh, toward a diplomatic solution by squeezing it economically um, to sort of force its hand. For much of the visit, he was... Uh, pretty refrained and uh, disciplined. He, he did not escalate tensions through his tweets and stuck pretty much to the script for the most part. And then, I guess, you know, there was some downtime. There was a report. They were trying to figure out what, and they said Melania left. He was, she was accompanying him, and then she left the trip, and then the wheels started to come off a little bit. So he started tweeting about all sorts of stuff, but he did tweet about... Uh, <laughs> Kim Jong-un, and he said, well, he could call him short and fat because he called him old, which isn't quite, you know, he is old, right? I mean, people call me old all the time. I don't say anything about you, and, you know, anyway. So there was a question on Piazza asking, like, what is he trying to accomplish here? And, and I honestly have no answer to that. I don't know. I think he just kind of reacted to the insult. I don't know. Do you think there's a strategy behind this? I don't think there's a strategy. I think there was an article in the Washington Post today where it was emphasizing how well the administration had stuck to the script yeah. for most of the trip, and then things collapsed at the end, and they basically they did the pseudo-psychological analysis comparing him to a teapot. He's just... And, just, and he holds just, it in, holds it in, holds it in. He's just got to blow off steam. And it, we're also suggesting that this is how his staff treats it. And this is, right. and so when this happened with the tweets, um, yeah, Kelly, Kelly said it was like, oh, whatever, you know. these tweets don't control my life. And and it's just become part of the process. Right. It is It is what it is. As yeah. you say. Now, Kelly has just sort of adapted to, he expects it to come, mm -hmm. and then he just ignores it. Right. Okay. So we're not going to talk about North Korea. Uh, this time, we're, we're going to talk about the second message, which was much different than this call for multilateral uh, support. Uh, what the U.S. was calling for when it regards to North Korea was this united multilateral sort of coalition against North Korea. And, but then President Trump also sent a strong message that the United States will no longer let countries take advantage of it through, in his view, bad trade deals. And he would lead the United States to follow its own way on trade, primarily by distancing itself from multilateral trade deals. And he, he very publicly and very specifically called out certain deals. And so we're going to have some um, clips here in just a second. So Trump stated that he prefers bilateral to multilateral trade deals, um, I think because he thinks he can strike a better deal. Uh, which could be the case. I mean, we're so much bigger economically than it, these other countries. Unfortunately, if that's his plan to swap out bilateral deals for multilateral deals, uh, as a future clip suggests, the rest of the world does not seem to be too interested in playing along. They have kind of rebuffed this. They are going forward with their multilateral deals because they feel better and safer about multilateral deals than the bilateral ones. And can I just say, on the bilateral versus multilateral approach, the Republican Party has a history of this. This was this, when the Republican Party was protectionist, largely up through World War II, but particularly in the 1920s. This was the strategy to handle trade. We want to have bilateral deals based on reciprocity rather than multilateral deals. Why? Because we, will have, we are a large economy. We will have more leverage mm -hmm. with other countries to extract better deals, namely better access to their economy without giving 
giving up a ton of access to ours in a bilateral negotiating forum than in a multilateral one. Yeah. So there's a history of this strategy think, within and the party and within the United States. Yeah, he's taken back, but the world's a lot different now than it was then, and I think that that's his chief challenge. Is, yeah. You know, there wasn't a yeah. North American free trade agreement. There wasn't the, you know, yeah. Uh, the EU, there wasn't the WTO, and so yeah. um, he's, yes. he's fighting an uphill battle on this. Yeah, I think. definitely. So let's focus on a couple of aspects of this visit because it highlights some larger issues related to the distributional consequences of globalization and President Trump's approach to global trade and multilateral free trade agreements. We're going to show several clips from speeches made by both President Trump and Chinese President Xi delivered at the Asia Pacific Economic Council or APEC meetings in Vietnam. These meetings were a highlight of Trump's Asia visit because it brought together leaders from across Asia, primarily to discuss trade and issues surrounding globalization. The first two clips we will show come from President Trump. So let's run the first of those now. Countries were embraced by the World Trade Organization even if they did not abide by its stated principles. Simply put, we have not been treated fairly by the World Trade Organization. Organizations like the WTO can only function properly when all members follow the rules and respect the sovereign rights of every member. We cannot achieve open markets if we do not ensure fair market access. In the end, unfair trade undermines us all. I wish previous administrations in my country saw what was happening and did something about it. They did not, but I will. From this day forward, we will compete on a fair and equal basis. We are not going to let the United States be taken advantage of anymore. I am always going to put America first, the same way that I expect all of you in this room to put your countries first. Okay, so this clip highlights one of the major themes of President Trump's views on global trade and America's role in it. That it's a general attack on the World Trade Organization and other multilateral trade organizations and the processes that monitor and enforce global trade rules. So I wanna make a few points here. First, it must be noted that the WTO is part of a global economic structure that was made by the United States. It is part of the Bretton Woods infrastructure that the U.S. put in place following the end of World War II to facilitate global economic growth through increased trade. It has been enormously successful. The central aim of this infrastructure was to lower trade barriers through a process of reciprocity. You lower your trade barriers and we will lower ours. The WTO was a successor organization to the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or the GATT. And the key difference of the WTO was that it included an enforcement mechanism, which were established procedures for enforcing its rules through a grievance or judicial process. If country A thought country B was violating trade rules through tariffs or other unfair trade practices, it could bring that country in front of the WTO and potentially punish it for such violations. President Trump is arguing that the WTO is failing in the central aspect of its mission by not uniformly upholding the rules and that this failure to uphold its rules has particularly harmed the United States more than other countries. In short, the U.S. is being taken advantage of, right, and also what's I think significant in the speech, it's being taken advantage of by other countries by its own creation. He then goes on to say that the U.S. will no longer allow this stance. And so we're going to run a second clip now from Trump's speech at APEC. Both the United States and China will have a more prosperous future if we can achieve a level economic playing field. Right now, unfortunately, it is a very one-sided and unfair one. But, but, I don't blame China. After all, who can blame a country for being able to take advantage of another country for the benefit of its citizens? I give China great credit. But in actuality, I do blame past administrations for allowing this out-of-control trade deficit to take place and to grow. 
We have to fix this because it just doesn't work for our great American companies, and it doesn't work for our great American workers. It is just not sustainable. So this particular part of President Trump's speech made quite a splash because he made a pointed remark that he does not blame China and got applause for it, for what, he, what he sees as an unfair trading relationship between the United States and China. This was somewhat of a backhanded compliment, though. According to Trump, China did indeed take advantage of the U.S. by engaging in numerous unfair trading practices that did not give U.S. companies the same market access as Chinese companies received in the American market. It manipulated its currency to advantage its economic interests, and China did not provide protection for intellectual property. So these actions led to a huge trade imbalance in which the United States imports much more from China than it exports. However, Trump argues that he doesn't blame China because it was simply acting in its own economic self-interest as a country should do. Instead, he blames previous American administrations for allowing this relationship to develop in such a way that did not work in the best economic interest of the United States. Trump then goes on to issue a warning of sorts in that the United States would now start to act more like China has in the past and go its own way on trade. He will renegotiate what he sees as unfair trade relationships. And this is the second key part of his message. Rather than acting to maintain the system as its hegemon and its creator, Trump wants to challenge the system. Sometimes he threatens that the U.S. will pull out of key elements of global free trade agreements, such as its current attempts to renegotiate NAFTA with Canada and Mexico. Now, it's unclear whether these negotiations will fix the system or lead to the end of the trade pact through American withdrawal. So now let's show one more clip, this time of President Xi of China. We are seeing a profound change in economic globalization. Over the last few decades, economic globalization has contributed significantly to global growth. Indeed, it has become an irreversible historical trend. Against the backdrop of evolving global development, economic globalization also faces new adjustments in both form and substance. In pursuing economic globalization, we should make it more open, more inclusive, more balanced, more equitable, and more beneficial to all. We are seeing a profound change in the system of global economic growth, uh, governance. The evolving global economic environment demands more from the system of global economic governance. We should uphold multilateralism, pursue shared growth, through consultation and collaboration, forge closer partnerships, and build a community with a shared future for mankind. This, I believe, is what we should do in conducting global economic governance in new era. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, faced with the profound changes in the global economy, should we, the Asia-Pacific economies, lead reform and innovation, or should we hesitate and proceed haughtingly? Should we steer economic globalization, or should we dither and stall in the face of challenge? Should we jointly advance regional cooperation, or should we go our separate ways? Here is my answer. We must advance with the trend of times, live up to our responsibility, and work together to deliver a bright future of development and prosperity for the Asia-Pacific. So I want to diverge here a little bit and just give you some sense of the historic transformation that you just witnessed with the, really the right. juxtaposition of those two very different takes on globalization. If you would have asked somebody five years ago whether you would have the president of China standing up and embracing multilateralism, calling for a more open global economy that was committed to the principles of shared growth, while you had an American president 
standing basically on the same podium saying we need more protectionism, we need more bilateral trade deals, right. we need to move away from the system that has benefited us over the last 75 years. I mean, this is historic, right? Remember, right. this is this is a the leader of a communist party right. saying we want to embrace globalization and capitalism and the leader of the country most associated with capitalism saying we don't like capitalism yeah. anymore. I mean, that's the, yeah. that's the implication, right? I mean, right. because at its base, the way that you inject Intrigue. more competition into domestic markets is by opening them to international competition, right? Globalization openness is just another manifestation of capitalism. And so we have completely flipped the switch, so to speak, from where the world has been in the last 70 years. And, and we see that in those two completely different approaches to globalization by the leaders of China and the United States. And it's the way that we would have predicted, it's complete opposite of what we would have expected for the last 70 years. Right, and, and it's not just the juxtaposition of the United States and China, but what's happening within the United States. I mean, to see a Republican president yeah. do this, you know, the Republican Party just in the last administration was the Free Trade Party, yeah. right? And you had a Democratic president in Barack Obama making a coalition with Republicans in the Congress to pass the TPP. Yeah. He couldn't get the Democrats to do yeah. it, but he could get the Republicans. And so one thing to ask yourself is what are the conservatives thinking here, right? A conservative, especially, you know, your, your classic free market conservative is it, doesn't like trade barriers, doesn't like tariffs. You get rid of those things and let the market run things. You know, Paul Ryan, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's what, you know, a main part of the Republican Party has been, but that's changed now. Mm -hmm. The Republican Party is different now, yeah. and, that's, and that's part of the story here. Very different, right? Yes. We're in the midst of a significant change in the composition of the Republican Party and its core policy. Interests, and we and we're seeing this played out on the world stage now. So let's run another final clip here uh, from NPR. It's an audio clip about trying to explain, you know, what uh, is the implications of this from for the United States and China. So let's go ahead and run that clip now. President Trump brought his America First message to Asia during his Five Nation trip to the region. Here he is Friday in Da Nang, Vietnam, at the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum. We are not going to let the United States be taken advantage of anymore. I am always going to put America first, the same way that I expect all of you in this room to put your countries first. The president's already pulled the U.S. out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a trade deal with 11 other countries, and now those countries have announced they're a step closer to going ahead with the deal without the United States. I'm joined now by Wendy Cutler. She served as acting deputy U.S. trade representative during the Obama administration and helped negotiate the TPP. Ms. Cutler, thanks so much for being with us. Well, thank you. President Trump also said in that in that speech that, that uh, multilateral trade deals, quote, uh, large ones like TPP, quote, tie our hands, surrender our sovereignty, and make meaningful enforcement practically impossible. Does he have a point? Well, I disagree with that. I think multilateral agreements have been in our interest and continue to be in our interest. And I think it's um, interesting that just today, the other TPP countries without us announced a major deal Basically, they're going to go ahead with this deal without the United States. Well, and what are the implications of that? The implications are that the U U.S. companies and their workers, U.S. farmers, U.S. service providers are going to find that they're going to be disadvantaged in these 11 other countries' markets. So, for example, if Japan has a 38 percent tariff on beef, that tariff will go away for the 11 uh, 10 other countries, mm -hmm. but not for us makes our products less competitive. What, President Trump says, though, that he, he certainly opened to bilateral trading agreements with uh, any country, including those 11. Are, are, is that a practical approach that could re replace the effect of TPP? Well, to date, none of the other countries have responded with great interest. They're more interested in regional deals because they feel there's a bigger bang for their buck it has more impact, and it, it, it involves more markets, so therefore they can get greater benefit from these trade agreements. 
it's, so possible, you, it's possible that some in the future may change their minds, but right now none are banging on our doors for such deals. Pre- President Trump seemed to uh, laud China in particular for having what, <clears throat> what amounts to China first trade policies. Um, does he have a point about that, that China, China has succeeded by pursuing their own self-interest? I think we have very serious trade issues with China that need to be addressed. And I applaud many of President Trump's um, statements with respect to China and um, his determination, along with his team, to make sure that China opens up its markets and plays by the rules. Well, well let me press you a little bit on, uh, on that more, though. Has China succeeded by using some of the same strategy and tactics that President Trump essentially wants to use to promote U.S. trade now? Well, they have succeeded by putting up trade barriers. Um, they have um heavily subsidized many of their industries, Mm -hmm. um, and they have not provided the type of intellectual property protection um, that companies around the world need um, to sell their products. All all of which the United States would would, uh, supposedly find objectionable. Am I correct Correct. in that? Uh, Ms. Cutler, a, a last question if we could is china filling a vacuum the united states hasn't uh, hasn't occupied well it was noticed that president xi jinping made a speech to the apex ceo summit following president trump's speech where president xi underscored that he's committed to multilateralism he's committed to open trade he's committed to fighting the forces of protectionism and he wants to work with other countries on multilateral trade deals Wendy Cutler, who is now with the Asia Society Policy Institute, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you. All right. So let me just make a few points here. The the first one is how this message that he delivered in Asia is not new. It is in line with his larger message that is hostile to multilateral trade agreements. It was um, uh, used during the campaign to help him get elected. And as the clip points out, there are plenty of examples of this retrenchment from global free trade through Trump's hostility to free trade agreements. The United States pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership trade deal, which brings together a vast number of Asian countries, which excluded China, which was really important here because it was going to contain China, right? It could, and this could have tied the United States more closely to the growing economies in Asia. The countries in the TPP have announced that they are going ahead with organizing this trade plot, trade pact without the United States. And this is a huge deal. Another example is the Trump administration's tough negotiations over NAFTA and Trump's apparent willingness during these negotiations to simply walk away from this multilateral trade agreement. He's threatened that numerous times. Uh, this trade agreement ties the United States with Canada and Mexico, our uh, chief trading partners globally. So, so he is walking the walk, so to speak, and that's, that's a problem here. I mean, if you, if you like free trade, right? I mean, he's fulfilling these campaign agreements. A second point to make here is that not participating in free trade deals creates economic losers as well. So you could accept the argument that, you know, these free trade agreements have cost American jobs, but when you get out of free trade agreements, as the cl- clip notes, There are uh, those who were benefiting from those agreements that will now suffer. And in particular, American farmers are harmed by not participating in the TPP, as noted in the clip, but they're also going to be harmed even more if NAFTA collapses. And finally, on a more systematic or systemic level, it is hard not to view these actions as precipitating a retreat from global leadership on trade by the United States and the corresponding emergence of China to fulfill that void, as we just noted, uh, the juxtaposition there. Of course, the United States could change course in in a future administration and return to a position that, again, embraces globalization, right? We're going to have new elections. We're going to have more elections, right? Uh, And we could we could kind of revert back to a greater embrace of all of these things globalization multilateral trade agreements but that will be quite difficult if the world moves on as it seems to be doing without the united states and also if they don't trust 
U.S. commitments to such agreements. And so I think we've got a problem.